Washington County Medical Society. My name is Susan Wrangler Cerniglia. And my name is Gabrielle Funker. So first and foremost, we are just thrilled with the response to this event. When we started planning it, we thought, well, maybe we'll get 40 or so people to come out and talk about these issues with us. And here we are with 144. And a stellar group of panelists to share their information with you and to discuss questions. So we're really, really pleased and happy about that. And um, as you can see from your order of events, we'll have a couple of speakers and then we'll take some questions. So there are cards on your tables if you have questions you want to write, and we will also be live tweeting and pulling questions from there. So feel free to use those outlets if you have further questions. In terms of logistics, there are restrooms right out the door and to the right. So again, feel free to use those if you need them. And speaking of the live tweeting, our public health tweet, like a Twitter account, excuse me, is at WC Public Health, and we'll be using the hashtag WCHDCannabis101, which is also on the sheets on your table. If you didn't already take the survey about cannabis education and medical marijuana education, that is available on the iPads, and we will also send you a link afterwards if you don't have time while you're here today. I may have one more shameless plug for another educational campaign that we're working on. If you didn't already know, and hopefully do, there is a hepatitis A outbreak ongoing in Michigan. We have some hand washing materials and other swag out in the front, and we just encourage all of you as health professionals and residents of the community to get vaccinated if you're not, and to encourage others to get vaccinated. We still have 70 some percent of adults in the county that aren't vaccinated, and that good vaccination and hand washing are really critical to slowing the trend of the current outbreak. All right, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce our medical director, Dr. Juan Marquez who will be introducing our speakers. And thanks again for coming. Hi, everybody. As uh, Susan mentioned, my name is Paul Marquez, and I'm the acting medical director for Washington County. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing today's speakers. So our, our speakers for the first panel are Dr. Kevin uh, Benke and Dr. My, uh, Mark Weiner. I'm going to introduce them both, and then we'll go ahead with the presentations. Uh, Dr. Kevin Banky is a research investigator in the Department of Anesthesiology and the Chronic Pain at the Team Research Center. He is also a yoga instructor. His current research interests include medical cannabis, uh, as in uh, music, an opiate substitute in chronic pain, and self-management strategies for pain, such as yoga. Uh, Kevin completed his BS in biology at the University of Michigan and received his doctorate from the University of Michigan School of Public Health in Environmental Health Sciences in 2017. He joined the CPFRC in 2017 and currently leads several studies examining the effects of cannabis and cannabinoids on chronic pain. Uh, Dr. Mark uh, Weiner is a board certified physician in internal and addiction medicine. Uh, Dr. Weiner received his medical degree from Cornell Medical College um, of Cornell University and has been in practice for more than 20 years. He is a section chief of addiction medicine, medical director of substance use disorders, and program director of the Addiction Medicine Fellowship at St. Joseph Mercy uh, Ann Arbor. He is also the chair of the planning committee of the American Society of Addiction Medicine course entitled Pain and Addiction Conference. Uh, so without further ado, we'll start the presentation with uh, Dr. Banky. Um, so thanks so much for the introduction and the opportunity to speak here. Um, I'll just jump right in. I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest with any cannabis companies. Um, and so let's get a little context on this. I, I'm a public health person, so I like giving that background. Um, so there are now 33 states uh, with legal medical cannabis in the United States and 11 with adult uh, use or recreational cannabis um, in this country, despite the fact that cannabis is still Schedule One. So at the federal level, this means that um, under the Controlled Substances Act, cannabis has no accepted medical uh, use and a high potential for abuse. And this designation has had quite a few effects 
on the cannabis space. Um, one of them, of course, is the uh, ongoing war on drugs and the, uh, the burden that this causes um, to our communities, especially disproportionately those uh, of black and brown uh, communities and, and people who are also poor or low socioeconomic status. Um, about 6% of uh, arrests nationwide are for cannabis possession, and about 600,000 people were arrested in 2017 simply for cannabis uh, possession. So when we're thinking about the public health aspects of cannabis criminalization, we need to think about the effects that that has on families uh, when somebody is arrested or incarcerated, and how that affects their employment opportunities, housing opportunities, uh, etc. Now, this also affects the, uh, the research environment as well, because Schedule One substances typically are not easy to study uh, when it comes to their therapeutic properties. So we uh, know uh, quite a bit about the harms induced by cannabis. In fact, that's where most of the research funding has gone in the past decades. But on the therapeutic side, there's much, much less data. And while this is changing, as the laws are becoming a little bit more liberal, and uh, other countries such as Canada are putting together robust medical uh, cannabis programs, we're still in the dark for a lot of things. But we do know some. So what do we know? Um, in a paper that we published earlier this year, we found out that the bulk of people using medical cannabis nationwide do so for chronic pain. Over 60% of the qualifying conditions in state registers are for chronic pain. So this is some of the lowest hanging fruit in terms of how we can uh, most judiciously use cannabis um, in a therapeutic context and talk about it in a therapeutic context. So that's where I'm going to focus uh, my energy and the rest of this talk. Um, Michigan is actually quite an exemplar of this trend. So we've had a medical cannabis law in place since 2008. And of the almost 300,000 patients who use cannabis medically, over 90% use, so, use it for severe and chronic pain. And this is especially germane given that we're in the midst of an opioid crisis that has claimed hundreds of thousands of lives in the past decades, and there's a lot of um, potential and, and hype, certainly from the media, uh, about using cannabis as an opioid substitute um, or using it to help manage pain before giving people opioids. And so there is some evidence to back this up. We see in a couple clinical trials that when you co-administer um, inhaled THC um, or cannabis and it's a low dose of uh, opioid, you can get a similar pain relief as a higher dose of an opioid alone. We also see in ecological or statewide analyses that um, states with medical cannabis laws, especially those with dispensaries, seem to have lower rates of medical of, uh, opioid overdose deaths and hospitalizations. And we see this also supported in the observational uh, literature as well, in which we see that people report intentionally substituting cannabis for opioids in the pain management context. So with that, um, I'm just going to briefly go through some definitions, talk about the risks of cannabinoids, and then how to potentially use them in a pain management context with some practical tips of how to do so. So we know that uh, the active compounds in cannabis act, act on the body's uh, endocannabinoid system, which is an ancient system involved in many, many different functions um, listed here, but including analgesia, stress, uh, and immune function. And we know that there are many, many cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Uh, the one that we talk about the most and we know the most about is tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. This causes the high associated with cannabis, but also has uh, some analgesic properties of appetite stimulating, et cetera. Um, new on the scene is cannabidiol, or CBD, which uh, is non-intoxicating um, and potentially protective against some of the psychoactive effects of THC. It seems to have anti-inflammatory anti -inflammatory effects in um, preclinical studies. Those have not yet been translated into humans, but people are still using CBD quite a lot for pain and inflammation. And we know that it's a potent anticonvulsant, um, evidenced by the FDA approval of Epidiolex um, for orphan um, orphan epileptic disorders. There are also many, many other cannabinoids. Um, I think some of the other speakers might get into this more. Um, but basically, we don't know close to as much about these, but it's possible that they're interacting in some ways with THC or CBD when ingested. So that's an ongoing area of research. Um, in terms of how these, these compounds behave in the body, 
So as with many other substances, if you inhale or inject cannabinoids, you get a quick spike in the bloodstream, followed by a quick taper, while if it's ingested, um, it has a slower onset and a slower taper. So one can think about using um, these properties when considering how to give people cannabis in the chronic pain context is in terms of, say, extended release or fast release for PRN use. We also want to consider the, the way that these compounds act in terms of, there, there seems to be this U-shaped curve for cannabis effect. So on the y-axis, you can see uh, the green plus and the red minus. Let's say um, green plus is analgesia, red minus is increased pain. And there seems to be this phenomenon where if you take a small amount of cannabis or cannabinoids, um, depending on the person, obviously, you can hit a sweet spot where you get uh, pain relief, but if you go past that point, you can even have enhanced pain. So this is something really important when considering how to dose cannabis and cannabinoids um, in patients. So, of course, we know that cannabis comes with risks. Of course, it's often smoked, so the respiratory effects, the effects on the lungs from that. There's also risks of dependence and addiction. About 9% of people who use cannabis have a dependence or addiction issue, but that risk uh, doubles or maybe perhaps more than doubles in adolescence. We also know that in terms of um, the interaction with psychotic illness, that again, when used by adolescents or young adults, that the rate of psychotic illnesses increases uh, with cannabis use, and there's long-term effects on memory and brain structure. In the acute um, sense, there's also common side effects of dizziness, somnolence, euphoria, lightheadedness, etc. And uh, potentially one of the most dangerous things is vehicle accidents. So people getting behind the wheel of a car um, when high or intoxicated, um, that, that's shown to, to potentially be dangerous um, both to the driver and other people who might be hit by them. So how do we use these compounds in pain management? So first, let's talk about the different mechanisms of pain. So in the group that I work with, we, we think of pain coming in three different flavors. There's nociceptive or peripheral pain. This is caused by inflammation or damage to tissue. Um, and an example of this might be an injury. There's neuropathic pain caused by dysfunction or damage to the nerves. And then central, centralized pain, which is caused by disturbances in pain processing, uh, things like fibromyalgia. And of course, somebody can have all of these things together. So how, what did the clinical trials say? How do cannabis and cannabinoids hold up in these different types of pain? Well, there's been a ton of systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the clinical trials, and they all point out that these trials have many methodological issues, short length, small sample size, underrepresentative dosing, so the products they give are not congruent with what people can get in dispensaries. Um, and they sh typically show a small but significant, statistically significant decrease in pain with cannabinoids, but also um, increased side effects. So um, this is a mismatch with observational studies, and the type of pain that we see the, the most effective um, treatment in, in clinical trials is neuropathic pain, that pain caused by damage to the nerves. So in summary, we know that cannabinoids and chronic pain seem to have plausible therapeutic value at the right dose in the right person. And we should be mindful of the dose, cannabinoid content, and administration groups, because all of those things matter in how people will actually respond to these compounds. And since there's little or no efficacy of opioids in chronic pain, I think that it's possible that we should consider using cannabinoids before opioids um, in people who are at that point in their chronic pain treatment. Um, in terms of practical tips of how to use these, start low, go slow, use a verifiable source with credible third-party testing. Hopefully this will not be an issue in Michigan at this point, just given that um, now the regulations are going into place. And of course, minimizing harm by avoiding smoking. So if anybody has um, any kinds of uh, thoughts on this, we recently published a brief commentary outlining this philosophy. And so with that, I'm done. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs>
research in this field because I come from the more practical patient-based version. I treat patients with pain. I treat patients with addiction. And we really don't have a lot to go on in terms of uh, guiding patients. And it creates a bit of frustration for, uh, for doctors. And I want to kind of go over kind of where we are as treating physicians in regards to what do we do when a patient comes to us and has a question about cannabis, pain, uh, addiction issues, and things like that. I have only 10 minutes. Um, I think I have about 105 slides. To work <laughs> okay, so yeah, nobody paid me to uh, give this lecture. I don't receive any money or cannabis from anyone. <laughs> you can decide later after you get my talk. So one of the problems that all, I give a talk on uh, cannabis basics to uh, primary care doctors, addiction medicine specialists, uh, psychiatrists, pain specialists, and what has been a common thread throughout all that is that for a physician, there are, there's this collision of ideals. One is that um, for me as an addiction doctor, obviously there are a lot of concerns about recommending or condoning or allowing the use of cannabis to a patient where there's a risk of not only addiction but psychosis, which was discussed earlier. But also, since I take care of chronic pain patients and the what we have in our medical armamentarium has sort of fallen short for so many people, and especially now because I believe as the CDC kind of just clarified, the authors of the CDC report on pain management indicated that their guidelines were being misapplied. There are a lot of patients with chronic pain who are being withdrawn from medication very quickly, inappropriately, and harmfully. So I look at the situation and say, you know, I really want to help these people. So there's a collision of, of ideals, and I feel that from talking to other doctors who, who treat addiction and pain, this is very, very common, common feeling. And uh, there are definitely patients who at least report that cannabis is improving their quality of life. But that's a report, and when you were talking about a euphorogenic substance, that could be biased, to say the least. So if we take inventory on this whole medical marijuana, I put that in quotes because it really is not brought into medicine like other drugs or substances or interventions. There was a lot of pressure. There was a lot of pressure from pro-cannabis groups, and they did use uh, compassion as a manipulation. So the doctors felt they needed to uh, uh, allow for this. But it, it, didn't, it didn't really work that well. And a lot of doctors felt that cannabis was forced into their their world, and they didn't feel comfortable because as, as doctors, we are not trained in the use of cannabis anywhere in medical school. It still is not um, found in any text for palliative care, for pain management. It's not there yet, but there's work going on. Hopefully, we'll get something, but right now, there's just not enough information for us to really provide and guide a patient appropriately. So, so the patients are frustrated, the doctors are frustrated, that's the setting in most situations, okay? So um, what I have taught doctors to do first is to encourage conversations about cannabis. We could learn a lot from what a patient is asking about, what, what they feel is missing in their treatment by why they're on cannabis. When somebody has a cannabis positive drug screen, I love it. I love it. It is an opening for a great conversation about why they're using, what they're using, what they, what their perceptions are regarding why they should be using it. It gives me a lot of information to better manage that patient. What I'm hoping that other doctors will do, and this is kind of a, my spiel to other doctors, is you know have that conversation and be okay with it because you can get a lot of really good information about about your patient. I do clarify though with the patient just to set them at ease. And, where things are coming from is I am charged with being their doctor, not their you know advisor on other other topics. I'm not their lawyer. I'm not a moral specialist, a political <laughs> advisor. I'm not a spiritual advisor at all. I can talk to you about what I know medically, and unfortunately, it's very little. And and what I've tried to get doctors to realize is, in the absence of a medical opinion, be careful about giving your personal opinion. Because your personal opinion really isn't what you're supposed to be doing. And in the absence, you can simply say, I don't have a medical opinion, or I don't know. That is the most appropriate answer, I believe, than just coming up with, with things. So um, I, took this, I took these slides from a number of other talks that, that I've given. 
there is some interesting perceptions regarding the use of cannabis among patients that I take care of that come in contact with other doctors. And just to throw it out there, what, what do you think, you guys get a chance to answer one of these questions, which of the following is true when it comes to cannabis among US residents? 60% believe it has benefits mostly for seizures, 80% believe it has benefits mostly for uh, chemotherapy related issues, 80% believe it has benefits mostly for pain, 60% believe it has benefits mostly for pain, 60% believe it has benefits mostly for HIV or AIDS. Anyone? Well, if you listen to Dr. Benke's lecture, <laughs> you would have found out. But 81% of people believe that cannabis has some sort of benefit. And most of those, uh, uh, two thirds, believe it is pain related. So this is a belief, it's a perception. However, as Dr. Banke reported, most of the studies don't seem to show this in any robust, compelling manner. That's an important thing to just know if you're going to be working with patients who are asking about cannabis. So uh, what if the patient says, well, it's labeled like all my other medications, so I should know exactly what I'm getting, right? So this is a common conversation I'll get from patients who are using medical cannabis. So another question about perception is, what percentage of cannabis products are labeled accurately in terms of THC content? 5 to 10%, 10 to 15%, 15 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. By the way, 40 is the highest number you're going to get here. Any thoughts? Well, okay, there's a little bit to that. It's close, but, but a lot of the, the cannabis in, in various states comes in what appears to be similar to medical packaging where we're going to know exactly what we're getting. Uh, one of the largest studies looking at pack of, of labeling accuracy found that unfortunately about only about 17% were labeled within that 10% on either side, which is kind of what we use for generics have to be in sort of that level. So these were way outside the realm. So it, it's really hard to bring something into medicine and recommend if you don't really know what you're giving. Okay, it was, so 15 to 20% is the right answer. So then I get this question frequently. CBD must be okay because, because it has the benefits of cannabis but doesn't get you high, okay? Some of that's potentially true. The not getting high part is probably true. But as far as cannabinoid uh, pharmacology, you know, they're very different. There's lots of cannabinoids in cannabis, probably over 100. I think last I, last thing I read was 114 different cannabinoids that potentially have some sort of pharmacological uh, function. We know that cannabinoids are, have a pharmacologic action. However, what we don't know is what that action is, whether it's good, whether it's bad. Pharmacologic doesn't mean always it does something good. It means it alters um, physiology in the body. But some of those things could be inducing psychosis, like we, read, we heard about just about 10 minutes ago. CBD works very differently. It has a low affinity for the CB1 and CB2 receptors. As Dr. Benke mentioned, it possibly could be used in the treatment of THC intoxication because it can overwhelm and block some of those receptors. But we don't really know what it does. It's a very different cannabinoid. So right now, if we talk about what we can provide patients with, there is no compelling uh, evidence for medical use of either substance. Although Epidolex, which is now used uh, for the, this refractory childhood seizure, that was fast-tracked by the FDA, and still compelling evidence of its safety and efficacy does not yet exist. But it was pushed through. There are probably some political reasons why that occurred. So in my last minute, so summary, as of today, this may, this may change when all the research gets finalized and we have a new, new way of approaching it, is that cannabinoids are very interesting compounds. THC and CBD definitely have pharmacologic properties and may be helpful and may be harmful. My sense is that emerging scientific evidence will show that they are both helpful and harmful. How to use them, we're going to learn over time, or you may learn not to use them. And right now, physicians cannot justify recommending cannabis uh, or CBD for any medical condition. Currently, we, do, we can't really come to a scientific medical opinion based on the lack of safety and efficacy data right now. Um, and just as a side point, throughout history, any substance that activates the addiction center has garnered lots of attention. 
think of these substances. They're alcohol, opiates, cannabis, cocaine, uh, nicotine, and uh, they also generate a lot of money. So that's probably one reason why they're going to be around for a while. And I have been told to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and our patients about this. You can find the report for free on the internet. Just Google it and, and educate yourselves about cannabis use and what cannabis you know can do for our, for our bodies. Again, it's not without any with no side effects like any other medical substance, anything would do in their body. But again, the, the, we have to start thinking about how can we help our patients. We have an opioid crisis and people are overdosing day in and day out. And cannabis can be a safe substitute and that's what we've seen in our science. Thank you. We're going to squeak in another question here. What should a provider be aware of when discussing non-medical marijuana usage if a patient discloses? So again, as I talked about, I am, uh, I'd like patients to be comfortable bringing that information to, to my attention. Um, and it's a little, I guess it's a little trickier for me as an addiction doctor. It might be easier for a primary care doctor to get someone to talk about um, sort of non-medical or recreational use. But what I can do is just uh, educate the patient regarding the risks of developing dependence, which was mentioned in Dr. Benke's lecture, which is the same number that I know about. At least 9% of patients will become dependent uh, uh, and have the problems of addiction related to cannabis use. That uh, one of the biggest issues about cannabis uh, sort of legal, legalization is that the perception in, in the youth groups of, of anyone under the age of 30 is that this is a very, very safe uh, substance to be used without any caution. I would disagree wholeheartedly with that. That is not the case. Um, although there are some, there is a lot of interest in determining the positive effects of cannabis use, there is still some emerging evidence around the cognitive impact in both the young population and the older population and a number of other things that we don't know. So with all, with all due respect, I would say that right now, what, where it stands, cannabis should not be considered safer than what we have in some, for some things. It might be safer than others, but in terms of comparison of, of ondansetron for, for nausea versus cannabis, I think we know a lot more about the pharmaceutical. So, um, but for, for not recreational, for non-medical use, I would recommend caution. What can parents and stakeholders do to have safe and factual conversations about potential risks for abuse of marijuana? Should I take that one again? I'm happy to jump in. So, uh, similar to the last question, you know, there is a there is a risk of abuse. It is not um, a insignificant number. Uh, it, uh, patients have, who de who have not only patients who just use cannabis end up becoming cannabis dependent. What we found in the treatment of patients who have substance use disorder, which could be a higher number, 20 to 30 percent of our population, that cannabis is not good for patients who have addictive illness. Um, THC, the main cannabinoid, uh, directly activates the addiction center and uh, both in observational studies and in other research will destabilize patients who are in good recovery. So one of the most important things that we, we talk about are patients who are trying to remain clean in recovery is this is not a good substance or a good substitute Again, the data uh, is maybe less inc conclusive for people who are not addicted, and we're talking about pain management, but for patients who are determining between cannabis and heroin, uh, yeah, heroin is less likely to cause an overdose, but you're not going to have someone who's a heroin addict remain abstinent just by using cannabis. There's, there's not any evidence to support that right now. Uh, I would also say that it's important to... I, I, Having gone through the Just Say No and Dare <laughs> program, that uh, as, as a child in Michigan, I will say that those were completely ineffective in the sense that they don't give, like they, they talk about some, some things that are factual, but the scare tactics and the, the agency that they take away from children and stakeholders, I think is pretty damaging. It's really important to have as honest of a conversation as possible where the, the kid or the stakeholder can actually ask questions and get a true response instead of a no, that's an immoral thing to do um, kind of answer. So you know, I, I think having an open space, um, as you mentioned, I, I think it's incredibly important to, for, for people to feel safe in these conversations and to not feel like they're being stigmatized or ostracized because they have chosen to use cannabis once or twice um, 
and regardless of what their experience was with it. So I think maintaining that open dialogue is incredibly important, especially in any relationship where there are power dynamics. Thank you, Hat. My name is Stacey Hedegren with the Michigan State Medical Society. And I think in this day and age of social media and access to the internet, there are a lot of groups, organizations that are putting out information to help parents and others talk with their kids. So um, in one of my slides at the end, I have some uh, resources, but you know, they're toolkits and whatnot. So I would encourage also that people take advantage of those resources and as I think both the doctors mentioned, you know, have those conversations, you know, talk. Since we're on this side of the table as well. Uh, I agree 100% that as far as you know, when we look again at the science, if you are a young adult, a child or a young adult that doesn't require cannabis, meaning you don't have epilepsy, for example, don't use it. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the last part of the brain that matures is the frontal lobe in the human brain. And that's where the vast majority of THC receptors exist. So we don't know the longitudinal data we don't have. So if you're a, young, a child, young adult, don't use it if you don't require it. But at the end of the day, to have the conversation, an open conversation about, you know, this is a substance that some patients and some people use it in our communities as a medication for their chronic pain, for their epilepsy, for all sorts of different conditions, okay? And to realize, okay, that as a child, to, to, to have the conversation and to realize that this is a substance that is a very, very powerful medicinal, comes from a very powerful medicinal plant. It does have side effects. If you don't require it, don't use it as a young adult, okay? But again, to have the conversation, and again, at the end of the day, as parents in a general adults to educate ourselves. Go and look at the, the, again, the National Academy of Science and Neurology Medicine, look at that report, study it. You know, and you, you see and you come to your own conclusions, but at the end of the day, like I we talked before, I think if we don't, if you don't require it as a young adult, as a child, try to avoid it. All right, well, let's thank our first two speakers for all their great presentation. We <laughs> have a follow-up question. Uh, for the second, you know, for everybody uh, here. So we're going to choose our second, our speakers for the second panel. Um, we already heard a little bit about uh, um, Ms. Stacy Hedegar and Dr. Uh, even uh, Dr. Evan uh, Latinas. So uh, Ms. Stacy Hedegar is a director of the medical and regulatory policy uh, for the Michigan State Medical Society. Uh, MSMS is the professional society for uh, for more than 15,000 physicians and medical students across the state. Stacy has been with MSMS for more than uh, 11 years and has previously worked uh, in the Michigan legislature for over 20 years. Stacy is a graduate of Michigan State University. Um, so our second speaker, our second uh, presenter is going to be Dr. Uh, Evan uh, Latinas. Uh, Dr. Latinas is a chief medical officer at the Ohm uh, of Medicine and Mission. He received his medical doctorate from Loyola School of Medicine and his MBA with a focus in uh, health care management for the Quinlan School of Business. Uh, Dr. Latinas has done research as a published author in the fields of neuroscience, hematology, and most recently in collaboration with the University of Michigan in the field of cannabis, uh, with an emphasis on pain and opioid use. As a CMO of uh, OM, Dr. Latinas is a resource for patients and their families. He has an active role uh, in helping and educating patients on strategies for cannabis consumption, uh, aiming for best possible outcomes, as well as educating healthcare professionals on the scientific evidence for cannabis and its use in the clinical practice. So let's go ahead and start with our first uh, presentation by uh, Ms. Hedegar. Part of my role at the Michigan State Medical Society is to help physicians and members of their staff understand um, the laws, regulations, and how that applies to their ability to care for and advocate on behalf of their patients. So I think um, we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but um, we do know the national trends are that people are becoming more acceptance of the use of marijuana, either for medical purposes or recreationally. Um, and all the generations really have picked up all the millennials, Gen Xers, everybody, really that, that support is growing. Um, I think you already saw this supplied, slide earlier, but really almost every state in the nation has some experience now with either the medical use of marijuana or again as the 10 that have already legalized um, 
the, um, the recreational use, adult use of marijuana. Uh, one thing uh, was pointed out earlier, marijuana still is a Schedule One drug at the federal level, and this does raise a lot of concerns on the behalf of clinicians, um, because not only is it illegal to possess, grow, provide it, um, it is also illegal for people to help people violate the federal statute. So that puts clinicians in a bit of a conundrum, <coughs> oftentimes with concerns regarding that. Um, but there have been some changes. There have been some um, issuances by the U.S. Department of Justice, kind of back and forth. The Obama administration kind of recognized what was going on in the states and said, okay, um, we are going to kind of allow the states to take over that enforcement um, as long as we feel that enforcement is um, preserving of the public health and safety and you know looking at diversion issues and that type of stuff. So they kind of took a step back a little bit as all this has been going on. Um, then with the new administration, uh, Attorney General Sessions, he kind of reversed that. And now the new Attorney General Barr kind of reversed it back again. So you can see we have this shifting at the federal level that makes it very difficult to know you know, what is going to happen? Is somebody going to take action, enforce the federal law over the state's law? So right now it seems to be back more on that. We'll let the states do it as long as the states are being diligent in, in, in enforcing those laws. Um, also, the one thing I know we talked a lot about the research going on, and that has been a problem. There really were some restrictions on who could grow marijuana to do research on it, and really only the University of Mississippi is the only one that is allowed to do that at this time. But in 2016, the Drug Enforcement Agency um, said that they were going to open that up. Unfortunately, they still have not done that. And so then what you kind of see here is the, um, um, oh, sorry, I think I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, but anyways, um, there is, uh, federal statute to really um, try to force that to happen so that more um, entities can begin to do more research on this. And then we also had the passage of the Farm Bill uh, last year, which really looked at um, growing hemp and what is considered to be regulated as marijuana, what is considered to be regulated as, as hemp. And it really is, if it has the THC of uh, more than 0.3%, then it needs to be regulated as marijuana. So we're seeing some changes at the federal level as well. Um, also, it was kind of mentioned um, that there have been some FDA-approved medications. Um, the epi Epidolix, um, as mentioned, is one that would just happen that does have a derived component of CBD with that. Um, but it's very limited to very rare diseases that involve seizures. And then we also have synthetic forms of, of, of cannabinoids that are available too. And then again, this is the, um, the act that would um, open up research. So in Michigan, we have a few laws that really regulate the use of marijuana in this state. Actually, there's four. Uh, there's a marijuana tracking act that kind of sets up the monitoring system as well. But the main ones that we all kind of look at are the 2008 Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, which really allowed for patients and potentially caregivers to be able to get a registration card to be able to get medical marijuana, to, to marijuana for um, medical purposes. Isn't it limited what it is? And it requires an MD or a DO to certify that they have a debilitating condition to do that. And that, and that, that uh, medical professional's opinion um, that that would benefit them. So there was some kind of limits on who could get who could get a registration card. The Medical Marijuana Facilities License Act came about to be, okay, well, how do we, we now have this law, but how do people get it? How do we ensure safety of it? How do we do all that? So that was really um, provided licensing for processing facility, grow facilities, transporting, and whatever. Um, and then, of course, 10 years later, we have the Michigan Regulation and Taxation of Marijuana Act to allow for the adult use of marijuana. A lot of it, um, it, it sets up the, the fact of how much you can have, how much, uh, how many plants can be grown, but it also creates the need for a structure around, again, how do we control the sale, licensing, whatever about of, of that, and kind of the commercial use of it. So I won't go through a bunch of this, uh, other than to kind of say that, um, Here's a good resource as far as if you're wanting to know what the, the debilitating medical effects are. 
Um, and then also we should know that the Michigan Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs is the entity um, that is charged with overseeing all of this. So now that the laws have passed, they need to set out the rules to go ahead and enforce that. They have a good website, Michigan's Marijuana Related website, that goes through all these different, um, has provides information on the different laws, um, kind of uh, what the regulations are, what the status of marijuana uh, regulation is in, the Mich in Michigan right now. Now the new law required them to come up with regulations over licensure, test testing and packaging, requirements and standards for the safe cultivation and distribution, record keeping, security, and all that. So right, what they have done right now is they have uh, established emergency rules. So emergency rules are in place right now because the law said that by mid-December of this year, they need to be issuing licenses for people to be able to, to buy it. So in Michigan, it's legal to possess it right now. It's not legal to buy it for adult use right now. So we take the medical use out for adult use. It's not, nobody can sell it to you right now legally. Um, so that's what these emergency rules are going to set up. And the department expects to have those in place actually by mid-November. Now you can um, renew emergency rules, but only one time. So really they're going to start working on permanent rules. And most of their efforts, since they are the regulatory agency, have been focused in on how do we regulate this industry. So some of the health pieces are getting lost in all that discussion. And we've been trying hard to talk about the need for proper warning labels, for safety pieces and that type of stuff. But that's kind of getting lost. And I'm not criticizing the department because they have a, you know, that's a big load to handle when you're talking about the regulation of this. But it is an industry. So be, you know, don't be, you know, you know kind of confused about that. It's not, uh, you know, people are making money off of this, and so how do you regulate that? This is the universal symbol in Michigan, so products with marijuana are to have that symbol on it. And then we kind of take a look at what's, what, what next is going to happen. So we've kind of got the industry side of things. Um, what we think we're really going to start seeing is on the regulatory side. So this is kind of on the health professional piece of it. So your physicians, your advanced practice professionals, that are involved in this, the boards really haven't taken, the licensing boards really haven't taken this up yet. But the Federation of State Medical Boards, which is kind of the conglomerate of all the medical boards, is feeling some pressure from the state boards to say, help us figure out a couple of things. And the three of the top things were physicians' use of marijuana, recreationally, physicians' medical use of it, and when physicians might be recommending it as a treatment to a patient. So I think you're going to start seeing that uh, regulatory side of it that's going to affect health professionals. And really the, F the Federation of State Medical Boards is saying there's not enough evidence out there to say that physicians and other healthcare professionals can use this safely at this time themselves. And then they've come up with a model policy that talks about what happens um, if it's going to be recommended to patients. And a couple of these things are really good. So it talks about model guidelines really kind of like treating it like you would tobacco or alcohol. You want to know what, you want know, part of the medical history. You want to document in the medical record. You want to see do they have a qualified condition. If your patient's using this or you're helping them, then you need to be um, monitoring it and tracking it and doing all of those things. I think it was mentioned that you know there, there are dangers, there's risks and benefits, and those have to be followed. Um, so anyways, these are just a couple things. Um, that health professionals need to think about. So a couple things, like informed consent consideration. If somebody thinks somebody's on high, is high, or potentially high, you cannot get informed consent from that people. So some of these things are gonna come up. The other thing I didn't put in the slides, um, are things like Myosha has issued a fact sheet. So physicians and others are going to be seeing more and more things of, of conditions related to people working in the industry. So anyways, I know I've run out of time. I'm just going to show you. You can see at the end there are some good resources there. So thank you very much.
working at provision center, so yes, I might, and I'll show you my disclosures. I'm the chief medical officer at Home of Medicine, now it's going to be a mission. Um, and we see patients that have their medical cannabis uh, card that they come to us and ask for help. And this is what I've seen over and over again. Patients and people, including healthcare professionals, are desperate for information, including myself. Um, perfect. The, the presentation is works like that. Okay, disclosures. <coughs> So I'm the chief medical of, of uh, Home of Medicine, and I'm a medical cannabis patient because of migraines. Um, and uh, I started using cannabis for the first time, age 31, while I was in medical school, um, because of migraines. A friend of mine, I actually inhaled it, which is not a, the ideal way to introduce it in your body. But the, at the end of the day, my migraine went away. And that was a big uh, you know, light bulb for me to really educate myself on the science that exists, but also the historical records. And I realized that, wait a minute, this is something that as healthcare professionals we should know about, in, and especially in our time right now, because as healthcare professionals, we're not gonna be able to avoid the conversation on cannabis. More and more patients and either use it, or they have a family member that uses it, or they saw a documentary in the, at the, uh, in the TV, and they bring that conversation out in the, in the office, and we have to be able to help our patients. And we help that by educating ourselves and educating the patient. So the one thing I want to mainly say here, um, Three major ideas. So I'll, I'll stick maybe in this uh, slide here. So, um, like we were saying earlier, cannabis is a very, very powerful medicinal plant. It definitely has side effects, and you have to be cautious when you use it. But if you look at, um, and actually, here, let's go with this. And if you look at the science about safety, and you look at the safety right here. And it's going to be a very kind of a lot of very busy slide, but the LD50 and the therapeutic index, which is something that we look at any kind of substance that we use as medical substance, extremely, extremely safe in comparison. It doesn't have that mean that it's completely safe. I'm not saying that, but when you compare it with other medications, definitely much safer. For example, opioids, barbiturates, you know. And again, the safety comes from the location of the receptors in the brain. Areas of the, of the brain, like in your brain stem, which controls breathing, for example, very low percentage of THC receptors. Um, in comparison to opioids, for example, where all of a sudden, if you bathe your brain tissue with enough opioids, well, areas that control breathing are also affected, and all of a sudden, you have a very severe side effect, meaning death. When you look at cannabis and the scientific evidence, but also the historical record, Cannabis has been used as a medication literally for millennia. Zero deaths due to overdose, okay? Meaning just using cannabis alone, you know, and dying from it. I made the calculations for myself. I, need, I normally get, you know, pain reduction for my insomnia, for my uh, 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 migraines with about 10 milligrams total body weight. In order for me to come to the LD50, which is you know, 50% of the population that you give that substance actually passes away or dies, I need to consume over 270,000 milligrams. I get the benefit with just 10. Now, again, I, I realize that I do work in the industry, like I was saying earlier, and this is very important to realize that, but at the end of the day, I'm looking at the, the science and what we've seen with our patients. So the main kind of way that we utilize cannabis and what I want to do Tell, well, I tell each patients, and I apologize. This. So this is a presentation I gave at the university um, for the first undergraduate uh, class on cannabis that was in, in uh, the University of Michigan. And this is really, is it? this is basically the, the main way that we try and utilize cannabis as an approach for patients that we see. What is the CBD to THC ratio is very important. Depending on what's going on with the patient, use the appropriate ratio. If you have anxiety, well, you lean towards CBD. If you have insomnia and chronic pain, maybe you need a little bit of both, okay? For naive patients and general patients, initially, we just start with CBD, just because, again, of the safety profile and not the psychoactivity, there doesn't exist, so 
patients can actually start slowly and steadily introducing cannabis into their everyday life, trying to heal themselves. Uh, the second very important is methods of administration. How you introduce it in your body is very, very important. Uh, in general, I think about ingestion, putting it into your stomach as extended release, just because of the way you absorb it through your body, it takes about maximum effect you're going to feel is two to three hours after you, ate, you eat it. Um, and I will show you here methods of administration. Windows of effect. So this is another thing I will show and I give our patients to, for them to realize that all of these are tools from the toolbox, slow and steady use, and realize if you use it as an ingestion, maximum effect is two to three hours after you eat it, with a duration of effect about six to 12 hours, so extended release. If you inhale it, which ideally you want to avoid because of bronchitis and things like that, uh, sublingual, drops under the tongue, okay? That's fast acting, but short duration. So to think about these things as, again, tools for your toolbox. Slow and methodical use. So the third major um, aspect of, of cannabis use in the clinical practice that we found is, you know, where is it here? Give me a second here. There we go. Is dosing and titration. Okay? Do you start slow, very low doses? Okay? Methodical use. So you start at a very, very, very low dose. You pay attention when you look at the windows of maximum effect, like for example, as the tincture. You literally start with one drop, and you pay attention. I mean, you can start with a full dropper again, and, because you're not going to truly harm yourself. But again, slow and steady. You, you don't have to. Because of the safety profile that we've seen, as patients, we can take control. So slow and steady, OK? Um, you start literally with one drop. You pay attention, what is my pain level now? What is my pain level two to three hours later, uh, an hour later, which is at maximum effect? And slowly and steadily, you creep up on your dose. You tighten it up in order for you to reach your baseline. Now, ideally, you want that conversation to happen with your actual physician. Because and the issue is, again, like we talked about earlier, it's a schedule one medication. And physicians, unfortunately, it's very difficult to have that conversation with your patients, and it's it's really criminal. Um, and again, this because of the scheduling, very difficult as we've talked earlier to do research. So at the end of the day, what we've talked about here is absolutely correct. We don't have all the scientific evidence that we need in order to be able to say yes. You know, as as a healthcare professional, I can definitely you know believe that this will help you with X, Y, and Z. We have evidence, again, for chronic pain, for nausea and vomiting due to chemotherapy, and for MS patients. Like anything else, like I said earlier, it definitely has side effects. You have to be very careful with how you use it, okay? But at the very least, the one thing I, I want to, when I go around and educate physicians and nurses on this, is to start thinking about cannabis, at the very least, as an adjunct medication for very difficult to treat patients. When I say difficult patients, meaning they, they have chronic pain and the opioids is not working for them anymore, or whatever the, the symptoms are, are not controlled with the you know, methodology that we have right now, potentially cannabis can be an effective tool for physicians and nurses to help their patients. And like any other medicine, it can be controlled. As a healthcare professional, you can have you know, a systematic approach to really educate the patient. Now, unfortunately, we're still in the process of really doing the research on this. Um, so at the end of the day, we don't have the scientific evidence to say, oh, this is the appropriate dose, because we don't have those studies and we are collaborating with the university to try to do this. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I really believe cannabis overall, especially in comparison with other medications, is very safe. You can use it as a very effective medication, especially as a healthcare professional, to try and help your patients. And for patients themselves, first of all, educate yourselves, okay? Not only on the science, but also why is it a Schedule One medication? And you have the power through your voting uh, to really change this and force the government to actually allow major universities to do research on this plant, okay? Um, but at the end of the day, think about the ratio, CBD to THC ratio, think about the methods of administration, and start at a very, very low dose and systematic use, and it can potentially be a very, very effective medication for a lot of different conditions. Thank you.
same format as before, we've basically taken the questions that we think we're kind of geared towards the second uh, panelist, as well as the ones from Twitter, and we've uh, combined them into sort of more thematic type of questions. So um, we have a number of them, so one thing I will encourage the panelists is to keep the answers a little bit shorter so we can get through as many questions as possible. Um, so one of the things I think we talked quite a bit about uh, is, is you know, the patients who are actually taking, uh, uh, who are actually using marijuana, but I think that one of the concerns that uh, patients people might have is, is really other unintended um, children or other unintended people you know, taking marijuana just not realizing what it is. So the first question is, do you have any tips on the safe handling and storage of marijuana, marijuana products so that it doesn't get into the hands of unintended uh, audience? Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, really the recommendation, similar to opioids, think about opioids. You're not, you should not be leaving them out on the counter. You should be locking them up. That's really a similar type of situation you should take with the marijuana too. You need to uh, make sure it's in a child resistant container or locked away, um, not only for children maybe getting it, but for diversion as well. Uh, I agree 100%. Um, it, the one thing about storage is also that cannabis gets degraded with exposure to oxygen, exposure to light, and high temperatures. So keep the, the, the medication in a safe, dark, cool environment. And again, like you were saying, 100% in childproof containers, don't leave it out. Again, educate your family members so that what this is actually and what it can do to you. Um, but safety first, for sure. I would also say that the, uh, especially the type of product does matter. So many edibles come in the form of cookies, candy, uh, et cetera. And so those things are much more tempting to kids um, than say a capsule or a cannabis flower. So uh, notice, noting the difference between those as well, I think is incredibly important. Right. Um, so we had a very important question about these slides. They were great. So we are going to be making them available. So those of you that snapped pictures, great. But if you didn't, they will be available. Um, and we also are going to have a lot of questions that we're not going to get to today. The plan is to kind of compile those, get some answers. So we'll be following back up with our presenters. And that will be available to you on either the health department's website, um, the medical society's website. Um, we'll be emailing them as well. So if you did not leave your email, um, if you weren't one of the people that registered with us, please make sure to leave that at the front desk so we can make sure that we follow up with all of these questions that we're not going to get to today. Next. <laughs> I didn't ask a question. Mine was <laughs> All right, among our panelists, there seems to be some hesitancy in discussing appropriate dosages. How do providers determine appropriate dosing? <laughs> Excellent question. Very difficult to answer. Okay, because again, we don't have the scientific evidence and the studies to show what is an appropriate dose okay, because of the scheduling. And that's the, the, the workaround, so to speak, that we found is we start at a very, very low dose. Pay attention to the overall side effects and what are you trying to accomplish? What is your pain doing? Is it decreasing, increasing? All of those things. And slowly and steadily, you can try trade up. At the end of the day, that's not the, the best answer. And what I would like to tell our patients, you know, and, and what I would like to tell our patients is this is the study, it was double blind. All of this information is out, and this is the initial dosing. But at the end of the day, we don't know. In our practice and what I've seen, we start around 5 to 10 milligrams, either CPD or THC. Yeah, so just, okay. um, just from a regulatory uh, position, this is something that really is being debated now. So you have to remember, we have marijuana for medical use, and right now there are regulations that talk about dosing. Now again, that came from the state. I don't know what criteria they used as far as what they considered an appropriate dose. One of the things the medical society has been advocating is that for adult use, because again, people are using, not using adult use for medical purposes mainly, um, is that when you come out with these, we need to look at serving sizes as well. As Dr. Mikey mentioned, the edibles are a huge problem because really, how many people think a cookie is one serving? <laughs> it's like about six. So, you know what I mean? So, how think about eating a sixth of a cookie, okay? And as a serving. 
So we're really been trying to focus the, on the rules on appropriate serving size and then as far as for the adult use. And our providers mandated to follow the same rules and regulations for prescribing medical marijuana like opioids in terms of maps, checks, drug testing, informed consent. Thank you. So I think the first thing to remember is um, physicians and other advanced practice professionals don't prescribe marijuana. Okay, so that's one big thing. So it is not right now prescribed. If somebody's using marijuana for medical purposes, they have a registration card and they have had a physician certify that they have a debilitating condition to use that. So all the other prescribing requirements don't apply to um, marijuana, and remember it's a schedule one, which is not allowed really to be prescribed. Um, but having said that, anybody that is working with a patient and they're using marijuana should be checking maps, because you want to know what other um, medications that person is ta taking as you're helping them work through whatever issues they have. And they are finding some studies where, um, like even with surgeries, that um, if someone is a user, a regular user, that they may need, to, for example, to give you more to put you under. So there are a lot of reasons you should be looking and making sure you understand what that patient is taking. I just want to comment that a number of the patients who come to me with addictive illness um, started out with cannabis, and many of them have medical marijuana program cards. Some of the red flags that I would have hoped would have been identified when, before these people got these cards, these patients, is that a lot, many of them had psychiatric illness and substance use disorder pre-existing to when they got their card. And so I think that uh, whatever we're doing as, as a profession to help identify the, the riskier groups, we need to continue to do that uh, to, help, um, to help take care of them. I think touching on what you were just getting into, what signs should providers be aware of when determining marijuana abuse, medical, or recreational? Well, in, in general, the, the definition of addiction is a continued use of a substance or activity uh, despite obvious harm. And the problem with that definition, although that is the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine uh, definition, is that obvious to who, okay? It's really kind of hard to sometimes to the person <laughs> who is in the midst of addiction, understanding what harm is going on, taking a very complete medical history um, into medical issues, social issues, legal issues, psychiatric issues, and the chemical dependency problems helps identify people who are going to be highly at risk of exposure to addictive substances. And I think it's pretty clear, we've, all the panelists agreed at least at some point, that cannabis, there's no question that to some, cannabis is, is definitely an addictive substance. It can cause significant And one of the other issues I know we're hearing about is that in a health, as a health department is the issue of vaping, especially among young people with marijuana. What, if anything, would you say about vaping as a means of using marijuana at this time? Um, so I think it depends on what kind of vaping we're talking about. If we're talking about uh, vaporizing cannabis flour, that um, likely is probably less harmful than smoking it or combusting it. But if we're talking about vaping concentrates, things that can have you know, 70, 80, 90% THC, um, and other unknown things in them, uh, including residual solvents or things of that nature, then that becomes a much different question. And honestly, it's one that we don't have much science to back up, except to know that THC is likely the most addictive component of cannabis, and those doses um, can be quite high, especially, uh, and, and that can be a cause of concern, especially in, in uh, youth who are using it. One other area of concern is simply that most of our experience and literature deals with the use of cannabis products before about five or six years ago when THC content was three to five percent. Some of the vaping of the tinctures can be as high as 80 to 90 percent THC. That effect on the human brain is really unknown, but my guess is it isn't great, but we don't know yet what, what the answer is. I, I just wanted to add too, I think this is um, something um, that the public health departments and public health really throughout Michigan is going to need to be looking at is that, remember I mentioned this is an industry, so what we can do is we look at who else already has experience 
Colorado is a great place to look at is how they had to deal with this. And what they have found is that there are many devices that can be used to bathe and others that look like a pen, yeah. that look like a string on my hoodie. So I think we're all going to have to be very diligent when we start, when this becomes more prevalent in Michigan, is to see what is the industry doing and what do we need to be looking for. I know high schools in Colorado have had an increasing problem with adolescent use, and a lot of it is by using things, objects, that don't appear to be paraphernalia, drug paraphernalia. Um, the one thing I want to say specifically for the question about vaping, um, what we tell a patient at the end of the day, anytime you put anything in your lung, it's going to be aggravating. If you, uh, we have patients that they go from smoking the, the plant, combusting the flower, to actual vaporization. The coffee goes a little bit down, phlegm production comes down. But at the end of the day, vaporization is still aggravating in the lungs. The alternative that I tell our patients is, all of your causal administration, tinctures, drops under the tongue, okay? Which you avoid those issues, but it's still fast acting. So for patients that require pain reduction, immediate pain reduction, and you don't want to inhale, a very, very good alternative is tincture. All of your causal drops under the tongue. So one of the questions uh, that was raised is, uh, what happens to previous nonviolent drug offenders who are currently incarcerated in Michigan for previous marijuana possession or distribution charges now with the passing of the legalization. Is there any thought of what's going to happen there? Uh, I think I, I, I don't want to say too much because I'm not that familiar exactly with what's going to happen, but there has been talk obviously about um, you know removing those sentences and there is a bill um, before the legislature. It is. Senate Bill 262, and it's part of the package, but basically it would create the Marijuana Violation Sentence Reduction Act. So it really is something that is currently being debated at the Michigan legislature, by the Michigan legislature right now. Um, there are other municipalities and countries like Canada, for example, that are looking into doing a similar thing. So uh, hopefully we can take take some lessons from some of these other uh, places that are doing that to, to be more compassionate and retroactively um, expunge some of these sentences, especially just for possession. All right. uh, what drug interactions exist with marijuana usage? So again, not a lot of research. One uh, drug interaction that does come to mind is there, there have been studies regarding the um, level of impairment or ability to drive regarding uh, patients who are on cannabis and alcohol. And one of the findings is that at a, a combined level of, can of a THC and alcohol, both levels at which the person is unaware of intoxication, they can be significantly impaired. So the combined use of of, can of THC with alcohol is uh, quite problematic. Um, but as far as other interactions, I don't know. Yeah, the, the one thing that we've seen in our literature is especially with uh, epileptic patients that use uh, clonopil, for example, we've shown that it's a very um, drug-to-drug interaction can happen. Um, so it's, again, like any other medication, it definitely has this issue of drug-to-drug -drug interaction. The one thing I always tell our patients and I worry about is, again, are you taking barbiturates? Um, and things like that. Uh, what is your liver function? You have to be very careful. If you have already compromised liver, you have to be very careful of that. At the end of the day, again, unfortunately, our patients cannot have that, these types of conversations with their healthcare professionals, with their physicians in their office. And that's what we, we always tell our patients, that everybody in your healthcare team, including your physician, should know that you're taking this substance in order for them to help you. Unfortunately, again, because of the scheduling, very difficult to do, and physicians and patients are, you know, like what they don't know, because again, it's very, very difficult to do the science. So what I found in, in, in my readings and what I've seen in like anecdotal evidence, again, if you're an epileptic patient, you have to be very careful. Um, and also, if you have a liver function issues, you have to be very careful with that. Um, again, like any, and like we said earlier, anything you put in your body, you have to be careful. There's definitely drug and drug interactions. You have to be very careful. I 
know this started to come up with the driving um, issue. Are there any other comments we say about the issue of driving under the influence? It's certainly a, a big issue. I mean, uh, one of the main problems in regards to just pharmacokinetics and pharmacology is that we, we can't really always identify a drug level related to a level of impairment. And that's always going to be a problem. Um, I think Colorado is a state that's looking into ways to identify whether uh, drivers are driving high or not and whether the accident they just had was as a result of cannabis use. It's, it's going to be really difficult. and. Um, it's not my area of specialty, but I can tell you it's, it's a, of a lot of concern to, to many physicians and to law enforcement. Yeah, I think it's also a, a difficult space with having a, a test, or like a blood test or a breathalyzer test or something like that, because there's such inter-individual variability in uh, metabolism and the effects of, say, the same dose of THC. So somebody might feel no effect um, taking five or ten milligrams, while somebody might take might take that and not be able to stand up. So I think that it's really important to look at impairment opposed to, say, a blood uh, THC level. Great. And last question: um, what, uh, what is the law number responsible for prohibiting academic research on cannabis, and what do we need to do to work on changing this? Thank you. I I don't know the 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 law number that is on there, but on this slide, um, there is the new, um, let me get, the, get it up right. It is, so the law that would reverse it is the Medical Cannabis Research Act of 2019. Um, and that was, they, they had one introduced last year that didn't go anywhere, this is a new one. And it would require the Attorney General to work with the DEA to every year add a certain number, a minimum number of um, entities that can engage in research. So I would suggest that um, you know, check in with your uh, federal congressperson about that. Um, on behalf of the County Health Department and the County Medical Society, thank you so much for coming out and let's give a round of applause for our conversation um, and we're eager to work with all of you in advancing information education and advocacy if you're not already involved in your professional societies um, please consider joining um, WCMS and MSMS being one of them and thank you just again again we're thrilled at the turnout and this is the beginning of a conversation and I was a miss earlier in acknowledging that we are working, the County Health Department is working with the State Departments of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs to host this conversation and we have been brought in by them to work on the education and hopefully get a little bit of front of the recreational movement in terms of having good advice and good information and messages for both our health professionals and our community members. So again, we thank you and we will be following up over email with the slides and with an opportunity to share more information on the questions. Thank you so much.